Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. And welcome back, everybody. We have found a woman that has done so much in her life. She continues to inspire, and she's somebody that has dedicated her life to the rewarding career as an occupational therapist. But it doesn't stop there. She also has continued writing, teaching, inspiring, and also, not just in that area, but even in travel. She's traveled to 113 countries, all seven continents, the Arctic, and has visited all 50 states. And we're going to talk more with her today. She is our Centaurian recipient as well. Lynette Walsh is back with us. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Um, the um, sun is just uh, coming out in um, sunny California at this time of year, we get a lot of um, uh, clouds coming up from the Pacific Ocean, and they take a while to um, clear out, but I'm at a slightly higher altitude, 1,600 feet above sea level, so we get the sun first. And you're somewhere near Pasadena, California, is that right? I am in Pasadena, oh. California, yes, yes. I'm, I'm intrigued. Lynette, of all the things you've done in your life, the travel, which we're going to talk about in, in just a few moments, what made you center on California? Um, well, I always loved to travel. I started when I was 16. My mother taught me how. Um, and then I, I uh, as an occupational therapist, I was working in the National Health Service in England and I had opportunity to come to the U.S. for a year. Well, that that went quite well. And but after a year, our um, visa uh, work visas were getting a bit squishy. So we, um, my my girlfriend Diana, she went to Florida to Miami, and I went to Galveston. And um, there was another English OT there. And she had, um, she lived at an apartment complex that was across from the space center on the outskirts of Houston. And I was able to get a, um, a nice little apartment there and we used to carpool and everything. And then to cut a long story short, um, three doors down, I met um, the guy that I eventually married. And he was a flight controller on the space program we're not quite sure when we married, uh, when we met, but it was probably over the dirty socks in the laundry or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I was uh, through people I had known before. I I was offered a job in Maryland, and um, I and Jack and I were dating at that time, and I had to sort of surreptitiously find out if he had any honest intentions in my direction. So um, he said, yes, of course, I had to take the job. And um, uh, we kept in contact. And four years later, we, we got married in um, Maryland, and our honeymoon was crossing the U.S. in my beloved Camaro. Anyway, um, there were, we had been dating for, I think we'd been dating for about six years, so there were people at our wedding paying bets against us. And he was transferred from Houston to the Jet Propulsion Lab here in um, California. So that's how we got to California. What made you stay? What made me stay? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm you could you could have picked... <laughs> Any place in the world you've visited, you've visited so many places. What keeps you there? Well, um, uh, first off, uh, um, Jack was quite a bit older than I, but we were married for almost thirty-four years. So you know that's that's. And why move when you've got a a, a beautiful house and mm. uh, a garden and uh, wonderful neighbors and a great church to go to and you know, and money in the bank enough to go and travel. Um, 
we decided not to have kids. And <laughs> at one time I was working at City of Hope, which is uh, um, quite Jewish orientation back then. And, and these elderly ladies said, what do you mean you're not, you're not having kids? You're married. You're supposed to have kids. And it's like, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Lynette said, no, I'm going to travel. Thank you very much. Well, Jack loved to travel, too. So it, the challenge was, um, yeah, if you can find somewhere I've never been. I'll, um, so I would do the research, and then he would decide if we could afford it. And one of the first places we went to um, uh, vacation to was uh, Colombia, South, Amer uh, South America. So we weren't timid, that's for sure. Wow. <laughs> When we, we talk about, and we're going to get back to travel in a moment, when we talk about occupational therapy, how do you explain that to someone? What's actually going on during a treatment? Well, um, it's, it's, really, it's really rather fun. Um, we have to find out what the person's previous lifestyle was or is and um, what they want to get, uh, get back to doing. Um, I worked pulmonary for 13 years, and I always felt rather sorry for the a lot of those patients because they had big regrets. They said, oh, when I, I always planned when I retired that I would um, do this, that, and the other, um, but they were smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, and mm. it got to the point where their lungs were so bad they couldn't do that. So we used to... Um, do things with them that would uh, bring back some of that ability. And like very basic things, um, I mean, if you have a stroke and you're paralyzed one side, we would be the people who would teach you how to get back to daily living with showering, going to the bathroom. I always said if I had a dollar for every hour I had spent with patients in the bathroom, I'd be very wealthy. <laughs> Mm. But um, um, and then learning to um, uh, get dressed, uh, learning to cook, and if you can't do housekeeping, who can help you with that? Have you got family members that can help, or um, can you go to a rehab center um, either as an inpatient or an, an outpatient? And the biggest problem with outpatient is transportation, and that that can that can be a, a really big problem. But we often had to help with that. Um, simple things like if you're paralyzed and you've got um, you you have to learn how to tie your shoelaces with one hand. Um, try it. See how difficult it is. Mm. But you know you have sneaky things like. Um, we thread elastic shoelaces into your shoes, so they're slip-ons. Um, knowing what kind of shoes to wear when you're disabled. Um, and I was, uh, when I retired, everybody got cross with me because I was the one with the toolbox. I mean, they were my tools. It was a big box. Because I loved to take the wheelchairs apart um, do evaluations for proper seating and cushions and um, leg rests and all that stuff. So if someone had to be in a wheelchair, that it was the right one for them and that they could, they could manage it. Or we taught them how to, how to manage it and get around. Um, the other thing I enjoyed doing were home visits. I mean, if somebody is disabled or they're in a chair, and they live in a home with steps up to the front door. What do you do? Well, there are lots. There are lots of different situations with that. You can teach them to be able to go up and down the steps um, on their own, or you get some agency to build a proper wheelchair ramp that the person can manage themselves. Um, and of course. This was back in the days before there were a lot of um, um, those lightweight scooters that people use nowadays. And so they could be a big boon in, in somebody getting around. And are they able to go shopping or 
do they have to manage uh, public transport? It's all the sort of um, daily living things that you want to get back to. And an OT is very instrumental in doing the little things like tying your shoes to being able to ride a bus or um, get on the metro or, you know, whatever they need to do or drive a car. Um, I worked in one rehab place and we used to, um, the big fairgrounds that were empty parking lots nearby. So one of the therapists used to take um, uh, our customers, patients out there to evaluate them for driving a car. And um, he, this one lady was referred, so he went out there with the car and everything, and he put her in the driver's seat. Come to find out, she'd never learned how to drive a car. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was a bit of a, a misstep, but we, we had to laugh about it because it was one of those sort of glitches that happened. But anyway, but you name it, we, we can we can we always called ourselves the fix it people, so <laughs> what a valuable role that you've played over more than four decades. And in the beginning you received a distinction for your psychological occupational therapy practice exam. And this is going back in the early part of your career, your training. What does psychological OT mean? Well, um, it's actually uh, working with um, uh, patients who have um, psych uh, diagnosis, psych problems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now it's... Um, it's so much, um, uh, there are so many medications and stuff, good medications, not, not street drugs. <laughs> sure. But good, good medications that people can uh, um, be prescribed so that they can handle the difficult situations and know how to cope. And who has responsibility for their thinking? Uh, a lot of patients would feel guilty um, because they they couldn't cope with stuff, or they would be their thinking is is um, not quite straight. It's a bit irrational or paranoid. And we used to have to work with the the um, uh, psych patients. Gotcha. And um, um, and um, when I was first uh, student and working, we were working in um, uh, psych hospitals where you had locked wards and everybody was very scrupulized. There was a, one funny story about um, a guy who was an alcoholic and the attendants used to supervise them when they would um, go, you know, in the bathroom in the hospital, they would have a whole row of of toilet stalls and sinks and showers and stuff like that. And this one guy, he would only go in this one particular toilet stall. And sure enough, he had his stash, a nice chilled bottle of booze, in the tank of the toilet. <laughs> and I had another patient in a, in a different facility, and um, they were... Um, they were housed in, you know, three or four uh, beds to a sort of mini dormitory. And they had um, their um, toiletries or stuff on the chest of drawers. And this lady, she had a, a bottle which was labeled Listerine or some kind of mouthwash. But actually it was bourbon. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and then... Uh, um, down in Galveston, I worked with um, teenagers who were in a, a, a very strict, um, well, not strict, but a very um, structured program. Um, they, some of them had psych problems, some of them had um, behavior problems or uh, possibly close to suicide kind of depressions and stuff like that. So we used to have to work with them. And um, we used to take them down to the beach in Galveston and 
um, it was a bit crude because if you went to East Beach, you could find the hard drugs, the spent syringes in the sand, which was horrible. And if you went to West Beach, you could find the um, uh, pills and stuff, um, you know, because there were, there were um, drug dealers on the streets down there at that time. So, but, um, and we always had to take um, a, a can of beer or a bottle of beer and a jar of Adolf's meat tenderizer because there were jellyfish in the, in the surf. And if you got stung by a jellyfish, you, you, put, you washed off the sting with the beer and then you sprinkled it with a meat tenderizer and that took care of the sting. So that's wow. your trivia for today. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many who have said that if you urinate on a, on a jellyfish sting, that will also make it feel better. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, I, I've heard that one too, but I was going to, me- I was going to mention the clean version. <laughs> ah, well, yes, of course. Of course, and the meat tenderizer, you know. Um, it's also more sanitary, but anyway, um, going back to your travels, let's, let's isolate some of those trips. So someplace tropical, now you talked about Colombia being one of your first endeavors. Uh, yes. what would you say is your favorite tropical location? Um, well, Colombia was, was fina- fascinating because we, um, our trip was split into um, two. We stayed on the um, Caribbean uh, coast, not far from Cartagena, but it was a, uh, and we stayed in little bungalows in the, in the garden, almost jungle of the hotel. And then we had um, beautiful sandy beaches, but it was so hot there mm. that you had to get up very early and have breakfast and then go on the beach and be back undercover, you know, in your bungalow or going into town or something by 10 a.m. So that was interesting. And then we went to um, Bogota, and some of that's high altitude, which which was, um, we went to, on a cable car up, up to the top of a mountain by the city, and that I that was, that was interesting. And we stayed at one of the, the top hotels, which, of course, back then was dirt cheap. And we went to the flower market, and my husband loved carnations. And I promised these carnations were about, the flowers were about oh, five or six inches across. I mean, they were gorgeous. Mm. So we had to buy some carnations to have in our room. And at the top of the hotel was the most wonderful restaurant um, dance floor place. And we had a slap-up dinner with drinks and everything. And we both, um, Jack loved to dance, and I had learned how to. It was a bit unorthodox, but I had learned how to dance with him. So uh, we had we had a, a great time there. Wonderful. Um, hey, can I share something with you? <laughs> yes. My father had always said to me, there was three things he said, and this is my takeaway. And I didn't have a, a, a very close relationship with him, but th- what he told me was so important. Learn how to breathe, learn how to read, and learn how to dance. And oh, great. <laughs> all through the years, especially breathing, how important it is. Um, of course, reading. I, I regret not learning how to dance because now I see why... It's wonderful. But the one thing I wanted to share with you is my dad's name was Jack. Oh, how yeah. fun. How yeah. interesting, right? <laughs> yeah. So I want... But, um, another tropical place I'd like to go back to is Costa Rica. Because mm. we, we were on a ship, so we only had a couple of days there. And I would like to um, explore more of the, the country. Well, you've got uh, a lot of time to work on a lot of things. You've written... So much as a, a talented writer when it comes to travel journals and also chapters to books and articles, um, even about OT. Um, but also, you love to write poems. You shared one with us last time we got together. Uh, do you have one for us today? Yes, I do. And this is a, 
this was really rather a hoot because this was back when I was working in pulmonary rehab. And so this is, you know, quite a few years ago. And here's a white chick writing a rap. rap this is when raps first um, came out and everybody said, Lynn, you wrote a rap? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is about the, um, uh, the pulmonary team and every year we used to have um, we used to have a reunion, and um, it was a real sort of uh, festival. Everybody sort of dressed up, and and patients who had gone through the program and done rehab and everything, they would come back, and um, so team members would uh, do a little special skit or or something. So this was this was my offering one year. Uh, this is the pulmonary rehab and team three Halloween rap. As rehab is the name of the game, our two units are not the same. On team three, we have the folks. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, I'm right here. Yeah, okay. I, 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 my phone was beeping at me. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll start again. Sure. As rehab is the name of the game, our two units are not the same. On Team 3, we have the folks who come in here because of strokes. The other part is pulmonary, where lung disease is adversary. Our, team, our theme today is quite a muddle of putting together the rehab puzzle. Our doctors are the ones who must give us orders we can trust, direct the rehab, meet the challenge, of patient care the teams can manage. Our nurses are the team's backbone. With patient care, they must condone. The daily routines and treatment special with meds to give without a hassle. The PT game is ambulate and certain oddities of gait. So learn the exercises well so all the family can tell how successful you have been in the creative rehab scene. In OT, we try to tell how good we are at ADL with bathing, grooming, and then some dressing and exercise and tasks so pressing. Mm -hmm. Fulfilling goals are only ploy and independence is our joy. In respiratory therapy, they huff and puff with breathing techniques and all that stuff. To help to keep the airways clear, enjoy a breath of real fresh air. Then some folks concerned with speech, the patients to speak and read they teach. To swallow with care and not to choke, to problem solve and memory poke. Our texts are worth their weight in gold, assist the team without being told. They follow through with patient care from special treatments to brushing hair. Our social workers sort out the mess that patients get into when under stress, encouraging family with which to live and finding people their help to give. Therapeutic recreation is a new name that the games they play are still the same. Well, what to do when a person retires or to explore the outside they now aspire. Our secretaries have some talents rare when typing our memos and papers with care, answering phones, billing, orders, and stuff. With computers and printers, it's more than enough. Psychologists have all the fun in testing, counseling, one by one. But with the scores, they often find only left-handers are in their right mind. So our Halloween wish from all the crew is Casa Kalina, we're here for you. So that was our team. Wow. Wow. How long ago did you write that? Um, let me see. Well, I've been retired a long time. 20, it was probably about 25, 30 years ago. My gosh. And you made a reference there about left-handers. Um, what exactly did you mean by that? Well, um, when you're left-handed, most of the activities um, are 
situated in, in the right side of your brain uh, compared to right-handers and stuff is situated in the left hand of the brain, left side of the brain. Yes. <laughs> wow. Interesting. And, you know, it, it, it's obvious that many people who are left-handed, there are some challenges here because we're in a uh, right-handed world, so to speak. Um, fascinating. Uh, I, your, your energy and positivity is amazing, Lynette. It really is. <laughs> Even after all these years, you truly enjoy what you've done, what you're doing, and... Uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much for being here and sharing today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a, I've, I've been very fortunate. And um, one of my sort of mantras is never say no to a good offer. And the trick is to determine what's a good offer. Mm. So, you know, I, I don't think I was very ambitious. I would uh, work at, you know, the job I was in. And but I wouldn't be necessarily um, anxious to look around and change things unless it was something outstanding. I, it reminds me of what my mom used to say: in that, always say yes because you can always say no. <laughs> but at least say yes in the beginning, so you don't limit yourself. But if you decide, you always, you typically have the option to say no. Um, wonderful having you on our program today. And uh, getting some insight. And congratulations on getting our Centurion Award. Yes, I need to know more about that. How did that happen? Well, we'll have somebody um, <laughs> talk a little bit more about that because we're out of time today. But looking forward next time we get together. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Of course my kid's in the right car seat. Well, I think he is. Yeah, my kid's in a booster seat. He was ready to move up. He is ready, right? Her car seat looks like the right size. There are probably rules on when to move up to a booster seat. Aren't there? Rear-facing, forward-facing? I think I have it right. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Are your children in the right car seat for their age and size? Don't think you know. Know you know. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat. I know my child's in the right car seat. Or else I wouldn't get in the driver's seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council.